Hi, for this video, we're going to explore concepts of power and effect size. So power is the ability of a statistical test to detect a relationship or difference. So this is how much of an ability do we have to actually find significance if it exists in the first place. So this comes down to what we kind of talked about with type one and type two errors in that we make this decision based on a p-value, but were we right? Were we not right? Did we just not have enough power to find a difference when it exists in the population? We just couldn't find it. This is the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis when it is false, and therefore it should be rejected. So can we say that there is a difference, or can we say that there is a relationship based on our sample because it actually does exist in the population. Did we have enough power to find that in the first place? So Jacob Cohen, we'll talk about Cohen's D. Um, he is the father of power analysis and power is described as one minus beta. This is a different beta than regression, of course. Um, acceptable power is considered 0.8 but a lot of times 0.7 is really adequate, especially in education where we need a little bit more wiggle room um, because there's so many other factors that go into just the environment of education. And if you have a power of 0.9, congratulations, that's excellent. Power analysis is usually done a priori, meaning before a study starts. You wanna make sure that you have enough power to find significance before your study even starts. If you don't, then you're kind of wasting your time because you may not have a big enough sample or you might be spending a lot of time and energy collecting this massive sample when you didn't eat it in the first place. You could do it afterwards, but this can get really controversial. Um, some people really don't like this to figure out what was your power after you've already done the study. It's kind of a waste of time. So here's another way of thinking about this. If the null hypothesis is true, meaning there is no difference in the population, then we want to fail to reject that because it's true, which means that we would have made a correct decision. Now, as a researcher, I could reject it, so I could interpret my p-value wrong, or I could do my calculations wrong, and I could reject it, and that would be a type 1 error. So these errors are really based on our decision based on a sample of data. If the null hypothesis is actually false, meaning there is a difference in the population, we just couldn't find it, then that's an issue with power. And so all of this <laughs> operates under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So if we can't find reason to reject it because we don't have enough power in the first place to be able to find a difference that exists, that's a problem. So power allows us to find a difference if it exists in the first place. And it's a measure of that. Power is a function of a lot of things. So it has to do with alpha. It's where we 95% confident, 99% confident. We could be 90% confident, 80% confident, whatever you decide. Sample size, um, especially huge on sample size. The more people we include in the study, the more power we have. It is also based on effect size, which we'll talk about in just a minute. It is based on the type of stats test you're doing in the first place. So some tests need more power than other tests. And it also depends on the type of design that you are using. So let's talk a minute about what this idea of effect size is. So this blue and purple distribution, they are different. We can see that the means are different. And you will notice that D, that's Cohen's D. What effect size is doing is it is measuring the strength of a phenomenon, the strength of that difference. So is the difference between these two, how strong is that? So what we're doing is we're trying to measure the size of the difference. And this comes down to the different hypotheses. So if the blue was the null hypothesis and we are trying to see if the purple is significantly different than the blue, then we would fail to reject the blue if this difference isn't enough to be significant. If the purple is enough to be significant, then we would reject this hypothesis and we would in favor of the alternative hypothesis. 
So what we're really doing here is measuring the size, how far apart are these two groups? We've seen this when we did correlation and regression. We just didn't really talk about it in the same way. So with correlation, we're looking at the strength of that relationship. What is the size of the relationship? So is it weak, is it moderate, is it strong? Meaning, is it a small relationship? Is it a medium or is it a large relationship? Specifically, we talked about this with R squared. How much variance can I explain between the two? With regression, we talked about this with our betas. So the coefficients are actually our effect size. And I can't give you numbers on this because it's completely relative to your model and to the field that you are in. But you think about whatever coefficients went here, if beta 1 was a larger number than beta 2, then it has more influence on the overall equation when you actually do the math. So it would be a stronger effect than another one. We are going to talk um, in our practice and homework about Cohen's D which is used in t-tests when we're looking at two different means and we wanna see is what is the effect, what is the difference between these two. It's a little bit more than just the difference between blue and purple. There's a little bit more that goes into it. So a small effect would be a 0 0.2, 0 0.5 is medium, 0 0.8 is large. I have had Cohen's D's of, of 1.4s that is quite large. When we get to ANOVA, we're gonna talk about ADAS, which has its own system. So those are just kind of rules of thumb <laughs> that we use to talk about effect size. So is it a large effect? Is it a moderate effect? Is it medium? Is it large? So when it comes to these two groups, if this is the null and this is the alternative, this was a pre-post, let's say. So Pre-test, everybody was here. Post-test, everybody was here. So we moved the entire distribution quite a bit because of whatever intervention we were doing. That is a large effect. And so the larger the effect size, the larger the power of the significance test, meaning we can shade in all of this stuff. It's quite large what we get to include in power. And that also means it's a smaller probability of making a type two error. And remember, this gets kind of confusing. Um, we don't control the effect size. It just is what it is. <laughs> and it's completely different depending on what your field is. We find this out a priori, meaning before the study, um, through the literature. So what are typical effect sizes in this field when looking at these variables? You could also do a pilot if you're not sure. So if the effect size is small to medium, then we have to have more subjects to find a significant result, meaning it's really small. There is a significant difference, but it's small. So we need a lot of people to kind of fill in the gaps to show that there is a significant difference. Versus if the effect size is quite large, we don't need as many subjects because the effect, the difference is so big between those different distributions that we don't need as many subjects to kind of fill it in. Here's one way to look at this. So if we have an N of one, one person and one person, there is still a difference, but the power is only 0.26. So that is not adequate power to talk about this. So we don't have a lot that we can actually shade in. So even though these aren't changing, what is changing is the variance within each distribution. It's becoming tighter, it's becoming smaller, they're more peaked. And so this difference, even though that's not really changing, this is growing, and so we actually have more that we can shade in within each distribution. So here we have a power of 0.84, so more power as we get more people, and that grows very fast, as you can see. On the flip side, so more people, more power. On the flip side, larger effect, more power. So here we're changing the effect. So the distance between these two are very small. The distance between these two are quite large or larger. <laughs> and so again, when we think about power, we're able to fill in more of this difference. If we need to improve power, one way to do that is to relax your alpha, meaning instead of being 99% confident, maybe we're 95% or maybe we're 90% or maybe we're 85%. You can use a parametric statistic, meaning a stronger statistic. Um, means tend to be good, but if you're using a proportion or something else, a total score, 
you might be able to do something different. You can increase the reliability of the measure. The more reliable a measure is, then the less variance there is between all of your scores. You can also use a one-tailed test. So when you think about drawing that distribution, we're putting all 5% error, if we're 95% confident, we're putting all 5% on one tail on one side instead of splitting that 5% on both sides. So we have a better chance of finding something if it's a one tail. It's a little bit risky though. Of course, increasing sample size is the absolute 100% easiest way to improve your power. And then you can also increase the sensitivity of the design or analysis, but that's sometimes really hard. We are going to look at tables where you can look up power and effect size and sample size and how all that's related. Um, and there are computer programs to actually help you do this. So you can estimate your sample size in order to know that you have adequate power. You just need to know the effect size from a previous study and you need to know what alpha level you have. So we're gonna play with G power. Let's do that now. <laughs> 